Good evening, everyone. Welcome to everyone who's here in person and to all those watching on live stream. My name is Sister Joyce, and I'm pastor pastoral associate here at Our Lady of Pompeii Parish. Tonight, we're very blessed to have Michael Sekolowski as our April Faith Enrichment presenter in our monthly speaker series. Before I turn it over to Michael, if I can see, let me, <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about him. Michael Sekolowski has been a parish catechetical leader at Queen of Martyrs Church in Chictawaga for 24 years, teaching adults and students in their faith, and he's also served as a lead member of the RCIA team there. Since 2015, he has been their director of religious education. He has been married to his beautiful wife, Kathy, who is over here for 38 years, and uh, they have four children, ages 20 to 30, together. He currently works at ECMC as a clinical research coordinator for the kidney transplant department. He received a Master of Arts de degree in theology at Christ the King Seminary in 2015. While studying and learning at the seminary, he was given the assignment in Father Rick Rena's spirituality class to dress up and present the spirituality of someone. He chose St. Benedict and took, took a liking to this medium. Ever since then, he has presented many one-man saint plays through the years and throughout the diocese, telling the stories of St. Nicholas, St. Patrick, St. Francis, St. Joseph, and this year, the Venerable Nelson Baker. And tonight's presentation is entitled, She Did It All. Join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Sakalowski. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. And God bless you for being here. I'm Father Nelson Henry Baker, and I'm here today to tell you about my life. Some have described me as a, a people person, at times talkative and outgoing, though I generally didn't care to talk too much about myself. Well, that being said, I think I'll probably have to break that rule today so that I could tell you about my life to give you some insight into what I was thinking and feeling and what my inspirations and motivations were. I have to say, I felt a little uncomfortable when others would offer me a kind compliment. And I never really liked to take credit for any achievements that I was associated with. Why, you might ask? Well, because I had very little to do with it. And I like to give credit where credit is due. Let me explain. Everything that happened was not because of anything that I did. It was because of her. She did it all. Who is she? Well, our blessed mother, of course. So I've heard something that I have to ask you about, an effective strategy that thousands of Western New York parents have used when dealing with their disobedient children <laughs> that is threatening to send them to Father Baker's for misbehaving. Do they still do that? I'm told that just the mention of my name in any Western New York child would immediately behave. And so, unfortunately, as the years go by, it seems that many Western New Yorkers remember less about Father Baker the man, but they still remember Father Baker as an idle threat that their parents used. Well, one thing that I hope that you learn tonight is that our ladies' institutions were anything but the houses of horror that many children must have assumed they were. For some, consider them the best of their kind in America. So today, I endeavor to bring to you the real Father Nelson Baker, in contrast to some of those negative, imaginary conceptions of me. Come with me. I was born in Buffalo, New York. 
on February 16th of 1842. I was the second of four sons of Lewis Baker and Carolyn Don Ellen. It was a, a mixed marriage in the sense that our father was Lutheran and our mother was a faithful Catholic. I had a fine upbringing. I was raised in a, a middle-class family that I think was typical in many ways. My father, he was a successful businessman, and he operated a store on Batavia Street, which I think you would know better today as Broadway. And oh, how I love sports and music. I was an avid baseball player. I liked to sing, play piano, and even some guitar. Yeah, are you surprised? Yeah, I did. There are some good musicians among the younger set of the neighborhood, but Nelson Baker was acknowledged the best player and singer. He was considered a real catch by the girls. Okay, <laughs> well, after graduation, I joined my brother in working in my father's grocery store. God blessed me with a quick mind, and I was good with figures. My family often told me that I would do quite well in the business world. Well, along with these business skills, my spiritual development also matured under the influence of my faithful Irish Catholic mother. When I was young, I started to feel a, a pull towards the faith of my mother. I remember when I was about 12, my parents, they called me over. Nelson, here's a dollar to spend any way you choose. I was thrilled, and I decided to purchase a porcelain statue of the Blessed Mother, a sacramental that I always kept close to me. Well, I then completed my Christian initiation by receiving Holy Communion and Confirmation at St. Joseph's Cathedral. And as I continued to work in my father's store, I saved some money. I was even thinking about going into business myself when the terrible Civil War broke out. Well, I responded to our country's call and I served briefly in the war. Fortunately, my military enlistment was marked more by a humanitarian peacekeeping effort than by death and destruction. And I was soon back in Buffalo. And after I had been back in Buffalo for a time, Joseph Meyer, an old friend of mine, came to see me. And Meyer and Baker Grain and Feed was born. We were located on Washington Street, near where the Bisons now play. Well, it became a very successful business, in large measure because of our discipline and business sense. But you know what? Despite all my success in business and with a, a bright future almost assured, I started to feel a call in a new direction. My faith began to prompt me to find ways to use my skills to not just make money, but to assist God's people. So I became a member of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, where I met and assisted Father Hines, who was the superintendent of the Orphanage and Protectory for Boys at Limestone Hill, which would later become Our Lady of Victory in Lackawanna. Well, because business was good, I was able to provide supplies to the orphanage and even teach Sunday school classes there. And as I continued to serve at the orphanage, I began to find myself at a crossroads. I most definitely benefited from a, a good education and had gained valuable experience with my service as a Union soldier. And since God had blessed me with certain gifts, I was fortunate to have a successful business with a good partner. I learned much about commerce and acquired important skills, but I had this nagging feeling that wouldn't go away. I felt as if God was pulling me to use what I had been given to now serve God's people. So despite a, a stable, bright future ahead, something didn't feel quite right with me. And I found myself in this deep, personal quandary. Worldly success had been achieved, but some vague, nameless, nagging emptiness remained in me. I felt as if there was more for me to do and accomplish. 
what is my true path? God, can you show me? And I placed my faith in God. Whatever be our vocation, let us show that we are Christians and that we have a soul to save. And let us try to induce others not to attach themselves to earthly things which soon vanish, but to remember that we are here for only a while. Well, I then felt called to meet with Bishop Stephen Ryan about becoming a priest. Thank God he welcomed me with open arms. This was what God wanted. And it also, it satisfied my emptiness. But some who were close to me, they weren't so enthusiastic about my choice. My father didn't approve. My brothers, they didn't agree. My partner didn't want me to leave. But my mother approved. And so did God and Mary. God had given me a special grace to resist the lure of success and to be able to focus on higher things. And so, a new chapter opened on September 2nd of 1869 with my entry into Our Lady of the Angels Seminary, which I think you would know better today as Niagara University. I embraced seminary life. I took my studies seriously, and I adjusted well as I became spiritually enriched and fulfilled there. But just two years after I started, something very unexpected happened. I contracted a serious skin infection called erysipelas, known as St. Anthony's fire. And fire it was. As it began to progress, it devoured my skin. My leg, it was opened in 11 places. It was excruciatingly painful. And I received a full cup of intense suffering. My condition, it became so critical that I was taken to Sister's Hospital in Buffalo. I received extreme unction was expected to die. I resigned myself to the will of God and began to anticipate my coming death. I would have been happy to die right there. But God wanted me to live. God had other plans for me. And although my recovery was long and painful, recover I did, and I returned to seminary. And by the grace of God, come Easter, I was able to walk again, first with crutches, then with two canes, then one, and then, almost a year later, I was able to walk unassisted. Praise God! And so, I again jumped right back into seminary life with full vigor when I came across a brochure. And I read about a, a pilgrimage that was being organized to the famous shrines of Europe. Well, I had money left for my days in business, received permission, and I eagerly set out on a pilgrimage. I always had a, a strong devotion to the Mother of God, and the prospect of visiting the many shrines that were dedicated to her, that had a great appeal to me. But my true motive, though I never told others, was thanksgiving. I had just been spared from this long and painful illness, and was so grateful to God for my recovery, and also the vocation that I had been given. Well, when we arrived in Europe, the pilgrims, they talked excitedly about the famous Marian shrines that they were about to visit. And although I too was delighted to go see Our Lady Shrine in Lourdes, Notre Dame, and then to go see the Holy Father in Rome, I became increasingly intrigued and attracted to one in particular, Our Lady of Victory in Paris. I wanted to say thanks to Our Lady and her church. And a strong pull inside me began to lead me there. As I entered, I was overcome. My eyes looked upon the artwork honoring the Blessed Mother. And I was so inspired by the many crutches, emblems, and thanksgiving offerings for cures and blessings. All expressions of gratitude for the many miracles attributed to the intercession of our Immaculate Lady. I became lost in thought, and at that moment, a feeling though overcame my heart and soul that Our Lady of Victory had a very special message for me that day. I advanced slowly, and time, it seemed just to stand still. As I made my way further, the intensity built as my eyes gazed upon 
the most lovely figure I had ever saw of a lady holding a little boy in her arms atop of the altar. I was spellbound before the statue of Our Lady of Victory. From now on, I shall devote my entire life to your service. I shall devote all my thoughts and actions to your name. I promise that should God allow me life and health, I will with all my power spread devotion to you, our blessed lady of victory. You are my lady. And so this most powerful event marked the beginning of my devotion. And I felt as if the finger of God had guided me as I promised with all my being to dedicate my life to spreading devotion to the Blessed Mother under her special title of Our Lady of Victory. My visit to Notre Dame de Victoire in Paris. This pilgrimage, this chance, almost accidental visit was a powerful and transformative experience that gave me the inspiration and direction that I had sought. And I prayed that my devotion would deepen and mature even more with time. Well, after this life-changing experience, I progressed rapidly at the seminary and was ordained on March 19th of 1876, St. Joseph's Day. And to my surprise, my first assignment was other Father Hines at the same orphanage and protectory at Limestone Hill where I had previously dedicated my time. Bishop Ryan, he explained to me. I realize that this is an unusual assignment for a newly ordained priest, but you have a good business background. You are older, and I'm sure you'll be very helpful to Father Hines. So I spent four years there under Father Hines. But to be honest, I didn't see any hope for this place. It was doomed for failure for many reasons. Well, I was then transferred to Corning, New York, but after only a year, a message reached me that Bishop Ryan wanted me back in Buffalo. At our meeting, the bishop came to his point. Father, I'd like you to go to Limestone Hill and take Father Hines' place. He's moving to a parish where the work will be less strenuous. Well, I was 40 years old now, had, had been a priest for six years, but I returned to Limestone Hill with much trepidation because I knew that there were many daunting challenges before me. And when I got there, the outlook was even more appalling than before. The protectory was insolvent, having lost credit with all businesses in Buffalo. And the boys, they developed a disorderly and insubordinate disposition as they became increasingly worn down under their forced confinement behind bars. Financial stability and returning some order to the unruly boys had to be established. So, I attempted to disarm the boys, especially those that were angry with their situation, and then the world no. in general. No, I'm not going. I don't want to go to church. Why would I want to go to church if I don't want anything to do with religion? Why would I want to go to church? Son, don't wait for a hearse to take you to church. <laughs> and then there were tempers to contend with. Hold on to your temper, son, because nobody else wants it but yourself. And as far as our finances, it was bleak. The protectory was bankrupt. The debt climbed to $56,000 just for the protectory. This couldn't last much longer. The future seemed hopeless. And most importantly, the souls of the children. They needed attention. So I turned to Our Lady of Victory. God will do what I cannot do, and Our Lady of Victory will intercede. And I placed my trust in her to lift this burden of bankruptcy. Well, a group of creditors, they came to see me almost immediately. And that business sense and experience that I developed in my early years, that would become very useful. Do you all feel the same way? Because if you do, then bring your accounts to me tomorrow. 
if you just can't wait any more, then I'll pay them in full tomorrow. But mark my words, gentlemen, if you do choose that route, these institutions will never do business with you again. Good day, gentlemen. I'll see you tomorrow. And so we began a new chapter without a dollar in the treasury. Our Lady of Victory, I return to you once again. You know you are my Lady Love and you are the patroness of the ins these institutions. We place all of our needs under your care. What will you have me do? And then it came to me. What about an association? Help from friends. And I got to work. Each night, after a heavy day's work, I sat at my desk and I wrote letters to postmasters all over the U.S. asking them to send me the names of a few Catholic women in their cities who might be able to assist me in my work with these helpless boys. Night after night, I wrote the letters. I wrote to thousands of women and wrote and wrote. And soon, the replies began to come in. And an association was formed with its goal, the temporary protection of destitute, homeless, orphan children who are in, in imminent danger of losing their faith, protecting them and offering care until they could be placed in a good Catholic home, as well as saving them from the many dangers that beset their paths. Well, my reason for establishing the association was to raise funds. But... Through the promotion of devotion to Our Lady of Victory, it also became spiritually enriching for our members, and that then pleased me very much. And Our Lady provided. She lifted the pall of bankruptcy and replenished the treasury to care for her children. The association of Our Blessed Lady of Victory, it brought economic recovery, and then it enabled us to expand, and expand we did to care for the many desperate little children that were seeking protection. After the Civil War, many immigrants came to this country and with the drive for greater industrial output, this created huge problems in urban life. Overcrowded slums, disease, and misery were present. There were not just homeless adults, but homeless and orphaned children. It was an unsettling state where the unfit the sick, and the poor society fell through the cracks. Many children found themselves on the streets through the death of their parents. Some of these children's parents had, had died at sea while immigrating. Some died from disease, even accidentally. War orphans and epidemics carried off their parents. Others came from hardworking families that just couldn't afford to raise them anymore. Still others were just simply abandoned. Thousands of children were roaming and sleeping in our large city streets, opened all the snares of a deceitful world. Imagine a dying mother's heart as it bleeds while she considers the possibilities for her children being left behind. In her dying state, the, the pain, distress, and turmoil overcome her. Many mothers who were dying and couldn't provide for their families, they anguished in sorrow. A tearful mother's dying and fearing the worst. What will become of my sweet darlings? What will become of them after I die? Who will hold me when I die? Will I be And so, my heart bleeds 
What will happen to them? These wanderers headed to destruction. What can I do? What should I do? We should lift them up from the depths of despair and protect these destitute, homeless, orphaned children that are in danger. We can provide a haven for them and, and give them a childhood and teach them to develop their talents, to be a foster parent like Joseph, who lovingly cared for a son that was not his own, and their souls, their eternal potential and destiny, that must be cared for. And this was my primary motive, which propelled and inspired my work. Well, thank you, brother. Oh, bills, bills, bills. You know, my lady, as we're taking in more children, there's no money in sight. More bills are coming in to, to feed and clothe and heat. Can you take care of these? My lady, I come to you once again. You know you are my lady love. You have always come to our rescue and have opened to us the pathway to success. What will you have me do? You are my lady. You understand me. You make known to me the course that I should pursue. I do nothing without your advice and support. What shall we do in this desperate hour? I turn to you, my lady. And now, I'd like to talk more about my boys, who were special to me. They were of every shade of religion and of no religion. They came to me from almost every state, young and old. Many were homeless, untutored, wayward boys, unmanageable at home, and sometimes just lacking a good home influence. I wanted to make life for these boys as normal as possible in this type of setting. I wanted this institution to be a, a home and school for them, not a prison and labor camp. So I included sports, summer camp, and farm work to, to help soften strong-willed youth and then to round off the edges of sharp personalities. Well, the Baker boys, they also received a quality education, too. They were proficient in reading, spelling, geography, arithmetic, drawing, history, and philosophy. Even music and drama were taught. And the Sisters of St. Joseph were primarily responsible for teaching the boys by providing them with educational and spiritual instruction to help prepare them for life. And the sisters were invaluable. We sought to educate their minds and hearts, to care for body and soul, to build character, and then to provide them with the tools necessary to deal with those ups and downs of life. My vision, it wasn't just to save children from the streets, but they should be educated, morally sound, and productive members of society to be able to face the world and earn a respectable living. And in order to do this, we taught them the skills of a useful trade. The boys learned tailoring, barbering, carpentry, plumbing, electrical work, shoemaking, and repairing, photography, painting, and printing, Farming, cooking, gas, and steam fitting, all part of the program. And the brothers of the Holy Infancy were my trusted helpers in this effort. They were men of noble character, talented, and with a strong faith. We sought to hold up the Catholic ideal of manhood, and we put before our boys the picture of the perfect man, Jesus, to imitate Jesus who came to show us the way of life. So above all, we care for their souls that live forever, that Christ died for. Under the patroness of Our Lady of Victory, the institutions expanded and many thousands of children came and Father built as he undertook several construction projects. Finances again became a concern. The bills grew, especially during the long and often brutal Buffalo winters. <sighs> bills. Fuel bills are no respecters of persons. And like time, 
tides and trains, they wait for nobody. My lady, it looks like with the growth of your great institutions, we've incurred rising fuel expenses for heating, lighting, and cooking. A gas well. My lady, what if we should drill for gas? This could solve all of our problems. We could then use the money saved for other purposes. For the children. To feed and clothe them. But how do we do that? We need money. We need drillers. Well, shortly thereafter, I learned that the bishop had just received a $5,000 donation and was going to use it for a project that would benefit the diocese. After praying about it, I was convinced that this was Our Lady's answer to my prayers. Uh, but would the bishop think so? So I went and I saw the bishop, and after some small talk, presented my case. Father Baker, did I hear you right? Did you say dig a gas well at West Seneca? What has happened to you? West Seneca is notorious for dry holes. Hey, but, Surely you're joking, Father. But, uh, Just the other day, some experts said there was but little natural gas in this area, and whatever is there won't last long. It, Nobody has ever struck gas there before. There's no evidence of any gas that uh, lies But dear Bishop, Our Lady of Victory will help us find gas. Ah, yes, Father. Our Lady of Victory has helped us out of many bad holes, but it appears as if you're attempting her to put us in another bad hole again. You know that several companies have drilled for gas and got only dry holes for all their trouble. Uh, but dear Bishop, Our Lady of Victory! She won't disappoint us. But there's no gas there. If there's no gas there, then Our Lady will put some there. <laughs> Has Our Lady ever failed to help us, dear Bishop? Well, Father, I cannot go against Our Lady of Victory. Thank you. Now, there's just one small matter. <laughs> the money for drilling? Of course we have none. And you heard of the $5,000 given to me. Of course, Father, I'd be happy to give you 500 Oh, such a small amount would just be thrown away, dear Bishop. If Our Lady is to find gas, we need to give her the, the tools to do it. How much would these tools then cost, Father? At least $2,000. There's no use starting unless we give her a, a proper chance to find gas. We have to show our faith in her. Sometimes it seems like she deliberately tests our faith by letting us wait for success, but she never fails us. All right, Father Baker. You may have a $2,000 experiment. I only hope that you have interpreted Our Lady's wishes correctly. I don't believe in throwing $2,000 away into dry holes, nor into uncertain experiments. If there is no gas, not only is the money gone, but faith in Our Lady of Victory may be lost. <laughs> Thank you, dear Bishop. <laughs> We are going to dig a gas well. Tom, we haven't decided yet as to the exact spot, but it'll be in the field across the road. We'll know this afternoon. Your engineer or geologist will be here to tell us? Uh, she's not an engineer or a geologist, but she knows more than any of them. She's a real expert. She? A woman engineer? I don't know what you mean, Father. Oh, no, no, no. Our Lady of Victory will help us find gas. What does Our Lady of Victory know about gas work? Just wait, and you'll see. This afternoon, about four, we'll show you where to drill. So that afternoon, about four, the drillers were amazed to see a religious procession come out of St. Patrick's Church with scores of altar boys, sisters, brothers, and fathers. They marched across the street, reciting the rosary. Their father selected a spot at random. We saw 
invited it a blessing and sprinkled it with holy water. Then Father took a small statue of Our Lady of Victory, buried it, and said, There! That's the place to put down your drill. Father Victor then entrusted the whole affair to the care of Our Blessed Lady of Victory. In a few days, the drilling company began boring for gas, and the work generated much curiosity. The weeks passed. And later, Father Baker went to the drilling site and saw the foreman. Father, we're down 600 feet now. Father, if there was gas here, we should have found it by now, or at least some trace of it. Do you want us to keep on? Of course, Tom. Father, can I tell you something? Sure. The men are grumbling a bit, Father. Grumbling? They're getting paid. What difference does it make to them if they work at Limestone Hill or in the fields of Pennsylvania? I see, Tom. I appreciate how you feel. Believe me, I have the responsibility for caring for these children. God has given me his little ones. If I'm wasting money that belongs to them, then I'm going to have to answer for it. Our Lady of Victory has the greatest responsibility. This work is dedicated to her. She won't let us go wrong. So keep drilling. And when we've shown sufficient faith, our Lady will find gas for us. Meanwhile, the drill went down deeper and deeper, 800, 900, 1,000 feet, and yet there was no sign of gas. Only a few people watched the drilling now, and many began to doubt the success of it. The operation went on for weeks and then months, eight months to be exact, with no positive results. Father was forced to return to Bishop Bryant and eventually convinced the bishop to give him the remainder of the $5,000 for the gas well. As time passed, however, even Father Baker's supporters began to sour, and many became skeptical. You know you have literally performed miracles here, Father, and I'm sure no project you have in mind could surprise us. But this is not a project. This is folly. Sure, folly. Did you see how he just buried a statue and said that's where he wanted us to drill? That's not how it's done. What's wrong with him? A dry well? It's only a dry well. He's a laughing stock of limestone hill. <laughs> Father Baker, it's only a dry hole. Is there something wrong with Father's judgment? Dear Father Baker, the poor priest. Our Lady of Victory, I place this in your care. Prayers were redoubled. The drilling continued until finally... Father, they think they struck gas. They want you at the well, immediately. Father, did you hear me? <sighs> Victory! Our Lady of Victory promised, Tom. She always keeps her promises. You mean Our Lady. She did it all.
was shocked and horrified as he read that while cleaning out an old canal, dredges had dug up the bones and bodies of hundreds of infants and small children that had drowned in the waters of the canal over the years. How could this be? This cries to heaven, the poor innocent lives and souls of these poor children. How many a helpless baby is no sooner born than thrown into the sewers of cities, into fields and canals. It pierces my heart with grief. Something must be done. But what? Our Lady of Victory, help! We've always had an open door policy for boys. We've never turned any boy away from anywhere or any color. They come on trains alone as young as six years old. And now we're gonna do the same for babies. We'll welcome God's tiniest treasures with an open arm. So we'll place a bassinet right inside the door for them to leave their babies. Oh, do me a favor, sister. Leave open the door and let them in. All night, sister. All of them, Father? All of them. Now, any distressed mother could open the door in the middle of the night and leave her baby in the bassinet. No questions asked. No forms to fill out. No names. Not a cent in the treasury. They must be saved. God and Our Lady must and will help. And I'll need everyone's help. Sisters of St. Joseph, brothers, priests, doctors, nurses, parishioners and donors, Brother Stanislaus and volunteers. I am. And there were so many infants, we needed more space. So we built an infant home right in Lackawanna. That's all right. It'll be fine. You'll see. We have John from Texas, Brother Tom, Kenneth and Ryan, Brandon and Ron, Nick from Tonawanda, Jacob from New York. You want this a lot? I do. Even the Canadians? Yes. An astonishing number of applications were received. They came from poor mothers, the abandoned and destitute, the penniless widow. So not only an infant home and an orphanage, we built a place for the mothers to stay, a safe Christian environment for mothers and their babies. We have Chet from the Falls, Mike from Washington, Noah from Lancaster, Leo, Gerard, Joe, Greg, Trevor from Kentucky. Are you sure? I am, yes. Every day? Every day, sister, we'll just leave open the door and let them come in. And so we provided them care for both the welfare of the body and soul. And several thousand babies came, sometimes their mothers too. And as usual, there were detractors. This institution is an invitation to cry. A monument to man's lower instincts. An insult to society. An offense against the higher culture. Crude, short-sighted. These mothers need to pay for their immorality by having to raise their own children. He's protecting these women when they should be shamed. Rewarding bad behavior he is. Did you hear that? Oh, because I thought I heard somebody talking. Well, if they want to take it up with me and Our Lady, like I said before, we do have an open door policy. It's easy to condemn. But as our Savior said, let him without sin cast the first stone. We must assist in making this burden as light as possible. In most cases, men are mostly to blame. And these women, they're abandoned to the world and its scorn. We will save these young souls that were created in the image and likeness of God and never let this happen again. Well, if it isn't obvious, I like babies. Why all the fuss over babies? Well, they have souls for heaven. They're as welcome here as the angels. It was a rare day that I didn't make my way to the infant home, even after a long day. My first thought was those darling treasures. The smiling, the crying, it all touched me. Me, a businessman, dealing with bankers and merchants, brick and mortar. 
a superintendent sometimes weighted down with the responsibilities of the institution. But oh, how they brought me so much joy. Those little cheeks. Oh. I love those little treasures sent to me by God. They were more valuable than all the gold of the earth. And the donations came in too. Cribs, blankets, baby apparel came. How did it all happen, you ask? She did it all. You know, we tried to give the, the older boys the best we could too. Nice clean rooms, comfortable beds, good food. We spared no expense on them. They were happy. They were safe. Oh, good morning, boys. Did you pray this morning? Wonderful. Who did you pray for? For me. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Here's a cookie and some candy. You know, as often as I could, I would make my way to the yard behind the protectory where the boys played to spend time with them and, and talk with them. Not always about religion, but sometimes about their interests, as a friend would. Hello. Oh, Hello, here. everyone. Hi. Hello. Congratulations. Oh, soon enough. Here's a piece of candy for now. Sure. You know, I just might have time today. Sure. Say, boys, it's close to Thanksgiving, and guess what happened? A flock of turkeys flew into the kitchen yesterday. Good timing, right? Oh, how I enjoyed it. I tried to treat everyone the same, too. Drifting around the yard, I would stop and speak to some despondent lad, some little fellow with gloom and despair in his face. Here, son, here's an Our Lady of Victory medal. Whatever concerns you, you could take to her. She'll always take your prayers to Jesus. Nothing's impossible with God. Oh, don't forget, some of the best boys will get to see a movie on Sunday. Oh, I heard it's a good one. Well, I guess we got some glass around somewhere. Where there are boys and windows, you have two items of expense that you just can't get away from. Food and glass. Okay, boys, I got to go now. Bye. Have a good day. Don't forget to pray. Bye. Bye. There are no bad boys. There are neglected boys and mistreated boys, boys that are in trouble. But there are no bad boys. Well, sports 
taught the boys the value of good sportsmanship and teamwork. We had carnival days with games as well as running, swimming, and wheelbarrow races. But I also thought it was important to think up new outings for the boys to kind of change the pace and improve the morale. True, many of our boys were here because the courts committed them and some had troublesome pass. But I thought that continuous and strict confinement, that wasn't good for them either. It sours their, their disposition and darkens their outlook upon life. So I decided to grant the privilege of general outings for the boys. We would take trips to Niagara Falls for a ride on the lake steamer. We would even allow the boys to take a swim in the lake too. We had a, a camp for boys where they could sleep in tents and enjoy outdoor life or just enjoy being away from their regular routine. One of the highlights of the year was our annual auto ride and picnic. Members of the Automobile Club of Buffalo would come to Our Lady of Victory, load the boys into their cars, and take them to a city park, usually Buffalo's Delaware Park. There, the boys would enjoy all the hot dogs, ice cream, and sodas they wanted. But others were not as optimistic as me, and they tried to discourage us with their fears and suspicions. Thus, there were objections and protests. Father Baker, are you sure? They're stuck inside these four walls. No circus, no zoo, no beaches. Lots of fun in the park all day. It's the Delaware Park Auto Parade. All they need is a ride today. If they could ever get out of here. The sun shining, flags are waving. Away we go to Buffalo, off to Delaware Park. All the people wave for everyone knows my boys. The band is playing in the school bus. The Baker boys are on the road. The wind is blowing in our hair that day. It's an outing for everyone. The thrill of bouncing on the cushioned seats, seeing 130 cars, and a bugle's blasting in the cheering bus. They jump outside to run. Oh, there's plenty of eats. Barrels of sweets, enough for everyone. In the park, they're playing everywhere. What a blessing for the soul. And that carefree day, who some put down, was a memory forevermore. Cheer for the brothers and the sisters. Hooray! For the priests, for the automobile club. Hooray! You see, being sent to Father Baker's wasn't so bad.
Believe it or not, I've also been criticized for giving out money to anybody that asked for it. And I tell people that I find that the more we give out, the more we receive. I'll give you an example. This morning on the corner, a woman called me over. As she was being put out of her home because she couldn't pay her rent. Well, inside my pocket, I usually keep money for such a purpose, so I asked her how much she needed. And you know what? I had just that amount, so I gave it to her and told her to pay her rent and enjoy her home for another month. Just then, a man stepped up and pressed something into my hand. And he was gone. I looked. And it was a $20 bill. So you see, I give away $12 and receive 20 That's the way God works. When anyone stopped him to talk to him about a problem, Father Baker gave them all his attention, his eyes intent behind the steel-rimmed glasses he wore. Then when the problem had been presented, he would say... And now, now, I'm glad you told me that. Everything will be all right. You pray to Our Lady of Victory, and I'll pray to her too, for your intention. And you'll see, everything will be all right. And we'll get that to you. I assure you, it'll come quickly and quietly. We are going to build a shrine to Our Lady of Victory, and there won't be anything like it in the world. We haven't got a nickel to start this project. It should be our goal to not have a nickel left to pay on it when we're finished. The time has come to build a temple more worthy of our dear mother, one that will rival the sanctuaries of Europe, to give thanks to Our Lady for her constant patronage. We'll use the best materials to elevate the mind to heaven, a memorial to my lady love. Ladies and gentlemen, Lackawanna is transforming. Two twin towers and a majestic dome that rests like a queenly crown over the transepts ornamental colonnades that'll stretch out on either side, the finest workmanship, every inch consecrated to the service and adoration of the Most High God. Architectural beauty, artistic marble works of art, handsome mahogany pews, elegant stained glass, life-size stations of the cross. The high altar will be the gem of the shrine. Four red spiral marble monoliths in their crimson grandeur, like sentinels in regal splendor. And of course, a magnificent statue of Our Lady of Victory, the heavenly queen of the shrine, who helps all who come to her for assistance. And so, at 79, with my faith in God, I undertook the design and construction of a massive shrine to Our Lady, one so immense that its central dome was second only to the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. I secured the best architect and the best builder that I could find, and Our Lady of Victory did the rest. Four years later, we dedicated it, and we didn't owe a nickel on it. Thank you. 
And so we were forced to walk a different road. We were to serve God's people in new and different ways. We started a vast ministry providing food and clothing and shelter and money to those most in need. And we called it the City of Charity. We distributed clothes and coats and made every effort to meet the needs of those that were most ill and affected by economic fallout. We distributed three meals a day. Even the boys in the protectory, they crafted the clothes and shoes. You know, I always like to give out a few coins to the men in need. The men have to have a little jingle in their pocket for self-respect. As I said before, I was often criticized for giving out money to anybody that asked for it. But I tell people, let's put ourselves in their situation. True, some of them may have been careless. Some may have been lazy and didn't want to work. Some maybe just couldn't find work. They're hungry and cold. What would we do if we were hungry and cold? We would probably go to the corner store and steal a loaf of bread or a bottle of milk. And God's blessing our work. And that's all right. When I die, our Lord isn't going to ask me if they were worthy, but he might ask me if I gave. I would rather give to nine unworthy ones than to deprive one who is worthy. Well, the Great Depression, it gave me the opportunity to serve the poor. And then God put one last opportunity before us to serve our African-American brothers and sisters. It was a new ministry for an old priest, but we must break through this barrier. The prevalent notion was that blacks should stay in their place. There was a, a lack of opportunity, high rents, Low wages, insufficient protections of civil rights. And they were neglected. And I wanted to treat them just like everyone else. As a result, many expressed an interest in Catholicism as they saw how he reached out and helped so many. At first, I began to instruct 30. Soon it grew to over 500 under instruction. They have souls just like their white brother. But why is it that they've so long been neglected? They are true, devout, faithful, religious, genial, and kindly. Once, I thought that the only thing that could ever please me was when we built the basilica. But this has pleased me more, for I know it is a true blessing. Through all the years, thousands of boys have come forth, well equipped to face the battle of life. And afterwards, we heard of their many successes as they became businessmen, tradesmen, and artisans. Some went into legal and medical professions. Some became priests. Some members of Congress and state governors. We molded them to go forth into a world properly trained for life's combat, to be good husbands and fathers and good citizens of their communities. I always tried to give time to those that I met whether it be the mayor or bishop of Buffalo or the poor and the homeless, we attempted to elevate others for their own sake and for the betterment of the city of Buffalo. Some say we were able to save, educate, feed, and clothe thousands of Buffalo children, while at the same time keeping thousands of troublesome children off of the streets. What has Buffalo done for me? So much! I was born and raised in Buffalo, educated there, ran a successful business in Buffalo. I embraced my faith and worked for God here. Many have shown me love too. Many have honored, respected, and appreciated me. From the poor and the orphan to our benefactors and good bishops, Buffalo has done so much for me. 
and I fell in love with it and its wonderful people. I place myself and my work in the hands of our Blessed Lady of Victory. I sought her aid and help as I accomplished my work. And much has been done for others. And I haven't the slightest idea how any of it was paid for. As I end my earthly journey, I have no money in the bank, no bonds or securities of any kind. I'm indebted to no one, and no one is indebted to me. I have no property of any kind or any salary due me. I, left, I place my soul in the hands of our blessed Savior and our dear blessed Lady of Victory and hope we will meet again in heaven, never to be separated. I left this world the way that I entered it, a poor man who only saw God's glory and God's will. And so, I bid you farewell. And remember, I did nothing. She did it all. Thank you for having me tonight, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Our Lady of Pompeii. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you to Our Lady of Pompeii and Sister Joyce for organizing this. Hey, Noah. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your talents and your faith with us this evening. Your unique and inspiring portrayal of Father Baker has given us many insights into his life and will help us as we pray for his canonization. Our final faith enrichment presentation for the season will be a musical event held on May 13th at 7 p.m. entitled, Christ in Me, Arise. Join Mary Palmer and the Our Lady of Pompeii Music Ministry for an outdoor concert that is sure to be a healing, uplifting, inspiring, and motivating experience of the Holy Spirit. Bring a lawn chair, slider sandwiches, chips, and dessert will be served at 6.15, and the concert will begin at 7. RSVP is encouraged to the parish office or tonight at the sign-up sheet at the entrance. The concert and food will be outdoors, weather permitting. The auditorium is reserved in case it rains or snows. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening. Special, th special thanks to Sister Joyce, who engages our monthly speakers to our live stream crew, and to our Taste and Sea Committee for providing snacks tonight. There is a basket at the entrance if you're able to make a donation to support our monthly speaker series. Have a great night, and thank you again for joining us in person and via live stream. God bless you.